Shutter sounds. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Black College Experience, the 25th episode of season one of Black College Experience. I am one half of your Black College Experience team, Derek Thomas, down in Baton Rouge, and I have with me none other than the founder of Black College Experience, the Queen Diva herself, Keisha Kelly. What's going on, Kells? How are you? How are you? I'm doing all right. I can't believe 25 episodes? Yeah. Wow, that's 25 crazy. 25 <laughs> episodes of season one. And you know what? We keep, we're keep growing and growing and growing. Uh, H, uh, Black College Experience fans everywhere. I was in one of my social media groups, and they made a post that, hey, post about what you do uh, as a hobby or thing that you'd like to do. So I posted that I do sports radio, and I also, I'm also on an HBCU podcast called Black College Experience. And this guy was like, you're that, Derek? You're on with my Keisha? <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> she was like, he was like, oh, I listen to Who the guy? Marcus Gurley from Atlanta. Yes. He called that's you my his IT Keisha. Person. Yeah. That's it. He that, called that, you that's his that's Keisha. Guy. You know? That, so, I call him Mr. Alabama uh-huh. because he did his undergrad and his master's at Alabama. He's from Huntsville. He is the biggest, 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 biggest wrestling fan. Yeah, I know. He's like, the. Yeah, his equivalent to us traveling football, his equivalent, he's equivalent to that in, in wrestling. Yeah, he knows I, it all I, in wrestling. It's so scary. I asked him, I said, hey, are you going to listen in to Black College Experience tonight? He was like, man, it's the Raw Rumble. I was like, I know, yep. man. <laughs> but I, I just thought that was so fun because he was like, you're that Derek? I was like, well, well that Derek, what do you mean, that Derek? What's that Derek and, mean, uh, yeah. He was like, you're on with my Keisha. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah. You know, so you, you, just got fan, you just have fans everywhere. I, there, there, I, Marcus is one of my, my great friends. and He's actually, like, he doesn't live too far, but. He, he and I, I swear, we've had a lot, just, just a lot of different things. Um, he is my IT person here in Georgia. He is oh. my go-to so wherever I have a question. You just love he us IT me. guys. Just go ahead and say it. Just love you guys. Just love you IT guys. Y'all are y'all make the world go round. Y'all really do. But let's hop into this show because we got a, a packed show. We got a really great show. In the second half, we are going to bring on Coach uh, Brady, excuse me, Grady Brewer, and that is the – Morehouse basketball coach. We're going to definitely uh, be excited to talk to him to hop into what's going on with his undefeated. He's now 18 and 0. They are nationally ranked at number 10. So they just, they just steaming and rolling right now right. Uh, over here at Morehouse College. But let's start off with Senior Bowl. Right. There. What happened with Senior Bowl this week? Well, I, I got a chance rather. to watch, catch, catch the Senior Bowl yesterday, and you know, we had three. HBCU prospects in the game. We should have had more, but we had three HBCU prospects in the game. Uh, that was offensive tackle Brandon Parker, who started the game. Uh, Southern University uh, from North Carolina A and T. Southern University defensive back slash return man slash wide receiver uh, Danny Johnson um, and uh, all Miac two time Miac defensive player of the year. All world, all running all around everywhere. Linebacker um, Darius Leonard. Uh, on the Senior Bowl South Squad, and you know Brandon Parker, you know he um he had a pretty good game uh, protecting the blind side of the quarterback. Um, I think he had one penalty called, but you know other than that, he had a tremendous game. Um, he was spot he was highlighted a lot in this game. Now on defense, Darius Leonard, he had a Senior Bowl leading. 14 tackles. He was everywhere on that football field. Uh, and Danny Johnson had one tackle and one pass breakup. He was involved in several other pass breakups. Uh, and he got he earned a, a, a comment from Mike Mayock saying that, oh, that kid's got juice. And I think all three HBCU prospects in the Senior Bowl helped themselves um, as far as potentially getting drafted. Definitely Darius Lenard helped himself. Because, like I said, he played this game like he was playing for South Carolina State. He didn't care if he had um, LSU guys in front of him or LSU guys beside him or Alabama guys in the in the defensive backfield. He he was the best defensive player on the field, and it showed. 
It showed in pass coverage. It showed in his run stuff and ability. It showed in him uh, shedding blockers. I mean, he just he just was the man. And you know, I, I think we should have had more HBCU prospects. I want to be greedy. I think we should have more HBCU prospects because this is the game of games for All Star games. Yes, the other games are good, but this is the one that gets the most exposure outside of the East and West Shrine game because it's actually coached by NFL uh, head coaches. You know, uh, you had the Denver Broncos head coach, and I think the Houston Texans uh, head coaching staffs coaching this game. So, you know, um, just kudos to the HBCU prospects on, on doing their thing. I mean, they were getting buzzed all week long. I watched the practices. I recorded the practices and went back and reviewed them. They made themselves some money this week, Hills. And, and that's what you want to do. Uh, when you go to the Senior Bowl, you want to improve your draft stock. And I think all three uh, improved their draft stock tremendously. Okay. Now, I don't know if you got a chance to look at the article from The Undefeated. Mm -hmm. And the thing with The Undefeated, you know, they talk about sports, they talk about, you know, culture, and they talk about, HBCU. They talk about so many things that they have an actual segment with just HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And looking at the undefeated, they had this argue call, article called Three HBCU Players at Senior Bowl that are proven they belong in the NFL. And so looking at the article, of course, they talked about Brandon Darius and Danny. So now a little bit about this art, a little bit from this article. It says, coming out of high, out of high school, Danny Johnson from Southern, Brandon Parker from North Carolina a and and Darius Leonard. Um, from South Carolina State were snubbed by big schools. They were either too short, which was Danny, too slow, which was Parker, or not smart enough, which was Leonard. The stereotypes of football had their chance. It's too late now. Johnson had a 4.0, was a 4.0 GPA student when he finished with a criminal justice in three and a half years. And he speaks for all three alums of historically black colleges and universities here at the recent Senior Bowl when he stays with a smile. I know my rights. And those are. So, you know, they go on and they talk about, you know, just how they, like you said, the difference that they made and the things that they did this week, you know, this weekend at Senior Bowl. And they, they, they made their mark. They did what they needed to do. They made their mark. They, they went out there and they showed out. So there were, there were rumors, there was talk saying that Brandon might actually be able to sneak into the first round. Right. Because, because of so, his agility. But, Exactly. So, you know, we, we don't know what's going to happen. We just know from watching, from looking at and I, I'm the same way. I, I record it and then I'll go back and watch the practices, go back and watch the games, go back and watch all of the schools. Because for people that don't know, if you've never been to those bowl games, it's a lot that goes on behind it. Those practices, when you get those two a days, you got so much building up to the actual showcase. And I only know that because I went to HBCU Spirit of America Bowl. That's why I know those two a days, those drills, those workouts, those hanging with coaches, it's just so much. So, you know, props to all three of those guys that can get it done. Um, definitely, you know, definitely been on the horn on Twitter trying to make sure, you know, hey, look out for these guys because it's important that they get that same exposure. And just because they're coming from, your Southerns, your A&Ts, your South Carolina States does not mean that they can't play football. Once again, I always say it's X's and O's. People always find 20 other things, but, you know, congratulations to them out there. I'm sure they had a great time. Danny is just like, you know, he appreciated everybody. And, you know, we're back and forth, back and forth tagging them. But I'm, I'm very excited for all three of them and to see what's going to happen um, with them. Even with – now, Brandon Parker was even – I want to say he was one of the guys that was selected maybe for the award for the Black College Football Hall of Fame, correct? I think, yes, he was. He was one of the four. Yeah, okay. Uh, the only okay, so we'll, tackle, go ahead. all the rest of them were quarterbacks. Right. So we will see in the next couple of weeks what happens as far as that. All right, so let's move on. All right, up next, um, you know, um, Gremlin, uh, we had some HBCU alums or coaches who had HBCU ties uh, moving up the NFL ranks, Kels. Um, the Arizona Cardinals head coach uh, started his coaching career 
uh, at the HBCU level. I mean, that is uh, Steve Wilkes. Uh, he was the uh, Carolina Panthers defensive coordinator. Um, he is now the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. And I know he's coached at Johnson C. Smith um, and I think Winston-Salem State. Uh, but, you know, it's good to see a, a coach with um, – I'm sorry, Savannah State. Um, he has his roots at, 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 an, at an HBCU. You know, he didn't go to an HBCU, but uh, he, he started his coaching career uh, at the HBCU level. And that shows that, you know, hey, um, he had the ability, he had the talent um, to, you know, coach football and move up the ranks. Um, will this mean he will give other HBCU players chances? It's possible. Who knows, you know, but the thing is, it's good to see a coach that has roots uh, to HBCUs excel up the ladder and become a head coach in the National Football League. Um, elsewhere, a, a Grambling alum, and I'm pretty sure Chad is happy about this, him and Trey, Trey Hayes are probably dancing. Uh, Grambling alum, Eric Washington, uh, was promoted to defensive coordinator after Steve Wilkes was hired as the Arizona coach, Arizona uh, Cardinals head coach. Um, Eric, Eric Washington played tight end at Gremlin, but he transitioned to the defensive side of the ball as a coach. And he uh, was named defensive coordinator, of course, January of 2018. He was the Carolina defensive line coach from 2011 to 2017. So, you know, we know Gremlin has some pro prospects on that defensive line. Will Mr. Washington, will Coach Washington try and pluck some um, Grambling Tigers to play for the Panthers? I guess we'll see. I mean, he's the defensive boss now. So uh, it's good to have um, HBCU alums and coaches with HBCU ties excelling at the highest level of football because they may have a knack for eyeing talent uh, where other coaches may not think that HBCU players are not good enough. Well, you have a guy who coached at HBCU level, so he definitely knows that HBCU players are good enough. And we have a, a coach who played at an HBCU, uh, so he definitely knows that HBCU players are good enough to warrant chances to make it in the NFL. So, you know, it, I, I'm just glad to see um, HBCU, uh, coach with HBCU ties, uh, getting chances to further their careers. Um, something else um, that comes to mind as far as making history. And you're going to be happy about this. Um, going to basketball. I, I didn't know this when I saw this. I mean, I thought it was unique. Um, Southern grads made NBA history as being the first three, uh, the referees to play, to, uh, to graduate from the same university and Referee an NBA game. Uh, what do you think about that, Kels? With this coming from your alma mater? Uh, of course, yeah. You know, of course, I, I was very excited. You know, we we did. We talked about this. I think this was last. Yeah, it had to be last Sunday. Um, and it was very exciting to see that because oftentimes, you know, we have to celebrate in any way that we can. And a lot of times, I get this. They say, Kels, you find everything. You don't leave a stone unturned. Right. And we have to. We have to celebrate the same way other people celebrate because if it's a referee, if it's a coach, if it's a player, if it's somebody from the past, we have to celebrate the same way other people celebrate because we want them to get the same attention anybody else sees. I was talking to a young lady earlier, and we were talking about how they were talking about how Nick Saban recruits and somehow he was dancing to, you know, doing the recruiting. And so we were kind of joking about it. Well, going into deeper conversation with this young lady, she's talking about how her, her, how her dad was a recruiter, and he recruited for Prairie View. He recruited for Jackson State. He recruited, and I can't remember the other school, but one of the things that stuck out was my dad recruited Walter Payton. How many people can say my dad recruited Walter Payton? Wow. Like, how is, many people history. can say that? So I told her, I said, we're going to get your dad on the show, too. We're going to get your dad on the show, too. But it's 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 just those things. We have to celebrate the small moments. We have to celebrate the, the the biggest moments. We have to celebrate all of those things. We don't want those moments to pass us by because at the end of the day, they're all worthy of something like that. And to have three guys on the same day from the same college uh, officiating the same game, 
game is the first time that that's actually happened. Can you just imagine on the sidelines what the stories were? They're right. probably on the sidelines talking about Southern and everything else. And, you know, it didn't hit them, but it hits us. And so we're they're probably cool, but we're proud on this side. So, you know, of course, we make it more. And, and, and that's just the, the nature of the beast. That's just the nature of the beast. Anytime something like that happens, we have to talk about it. But let's go ahead and take this commercial break because I want to come back and talk about how Grambling has knocked off Pine Bluff and Valley has gotten his first win against That's Jackson right. State. You already won't wait to talk what? about that. Wait, well, we're going to be go right ahead. back with more Black College experience in 31 seconds. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. All right, we're back with more Black College experience. Kale's take it away. Okay, so last night you had Grambling. They have actually knocked off the last undefeated SWAC team, and that was Pine Bluff. Going to this week, Pine Bluff was 7-0, and undefeated in the conference. Now they are, I guess I will say, 7-1. and And... They have been defeated by Gremlin by one point. You know, those are the worst games to lose, 69-68. That's the worst game. Yeah. And when you lose like that, those are the the, the nail-biting, the scariest, the craziest games ever. Used to have games like that. I'll give you another example. Morehouse played this week in an overtime game against Benedict. I was a Benedict of Bethune. I can't. 103-102 in overtime. One point. Those are the scariest games yeah, to lose. That was One point. That's Benedict. So you you lose. That's 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 the scariest game that you lose those one point. But you you did it. A win is a win, and you move on. There. I know you proud. Yes, I'm y'all proud. knocked off. Talk about how y'all knocked off. You know they're second rank right now in, in the class. Those are y'all knocked off Jackson State. Well, well, kids, everyone, we've been taking on the chin this year. You know, neither one of our men's or women's teams had a win. Uh, we took your Jaguars to overtime in the men's game, and your girl straight annihilated us. But, um, and I predicted this win. I predicted we would beat Jackson State uh, on my uh, radio show here in Jack in, in Baton Rouge. I got ridiculed, talked about, you know, they wanted to nail me to the swag basketball cross, but my Delta Devils came through and beat up on Jackson State in Itabina. Girls and boys, men and women's games, got our first W's. Uh, the men defeated Jackson State 72 to 67, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was a, a ruckus in Itabina. Um, because we always like to beat Jackson State. I mean, it's Jackson State. I mean, yes, we want to beat other teams. But if we beat Jackson State in anything, that's bragging rights. And we, you know how we like to talk noise in the swag. That's bragging rights. And uh, our, our Delta Devils were led in points uh, by, as I have the score up here, uh, Kylan Phillips uh, led the Devil Devils. With 23 points, Dante Scott with 11, uh, Jordan Evans with 13, uh, Jackson State was led by Maurice Rivers with 15 points, and Diarius Austin with 12 points in the losing effort. So, you know, um, I'm just proud to see my Delta Devils fight back. You know, a tough season, you know, uh, to be defeated all year and to get that first win against Jackson State. I mean, I made a Facebook post about it. Uh, amid threats from uh, Jackson State Tigers, I don't care. I'm just happy that my Delta Devils got our first win. Uh, even though we're like one in like 18, it doesn't matter. We beat Jackson State, so I'm happy. So I'm happy. I think 
your beating Jackson State is as our equivalent of beating Grambling. That's right. That's how That's we feel. Rival. If you well, beat them, you know it's 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 a rival, and anytime you can beat those schools in any sport or whatever it might be, you're you're very excited. And meanwhile, Southern did knock off. Uh, they did knock off all oh, corn, cool. both men and women. Um, it was just a battle, just a battle right. all around going on. And so I think everybody's playing, you know, playing for keeps, um, you know, just to just to see what's going to happen. Now, I'll tell you what's been been kind of kind of shaken up. Texas Southern isn't playing up to the ability that everyone predicted this year. No, what are not. your thoughts on, 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 on Texas Southern this year and, and, and Coach Davis? Well, didn't they have a young man get kicked off the team? I can't remember his name. Um, one of the Griffin. Uh, yeah, the uh, no, 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 not Derek Griffin. Um, a point guard, I think. I I saw it posted in one of the groups, and they were saying that he was no. I don't know if it's true or not, but you know, um, I mean, Texas Southern is the defending swag champ, and no one would have thought that they would be struggling like this, uh, in the swag. You know, standings. No one thought Pine Bluff would be number one. I know I didn't, but that's uh, where the wins and losses are determined on the court. And not what come out, not what comes out of our mouths. So Pine Bluff was like everybody sleeping on us. We gonna show you all. But I don't know what's going on with Texas Southern. I know Bull, I know the uh, Texas Southern fans are not happy. You know what I'm saying? Because they're th- that's their sport. They haven't been winning in football much. And they've been dominant in men's basketball, but hey, they're struggling. And, and and Coach Davis, you know, he has the the coaching ability to turn this around. I mean, uh, he he's done it at the highest level of college basketball. He has the know how. I think his players believe in him. But hey, that other squad isn't gonna care what Coach Davis coach. They aren't gonna care. Uh, what those uh, Texas Southern players think uh, that that they won a swag championship last year. This is a new year, and you have to put up or shut up on that court, Kels. And that that is that is true. And the thing is, is that because they've made such a run over the over the course of time and over the years, you know, they're always predicted to go number one um, and make even even with the chance to to make the NCAA appearances. So you know, it's it's always good to have someone out of one of these HBCUs to make an appearance. But it also it's also going to count as, as to what you're doing right now in the SWAC, as to what you're doing in your conference, what you're doing around the conference as well. So, you know, like you said, they do have time to turn around because we, we're really just getting comfortable right now into SWAC play. But, you know, week to week to week, things can change. And these are the times, these are the moments that you actually have to look at it and say, hey, you know, what am I doing to turn this around? What can I do? to uh, be competitive, how can I change the situation, you know, what can we do to to turn these things around. So I guess we shall see how this goes and what will actually happen for in the, I guess, in the time to come for Texas Southern. Right. I mean, right. I mean, I mean, they're sitting fourth in the swag, and, I mean, it's still a long season. I guess we'll see. I mean, maybe my Delta Devils can get on a run and, you know, um, cause some trouble in the swag. I, I would like to see it. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see, Kels. Um, let's see here. Um, got some swag recruiting news while we're in the swag. Um, okay. You know, Jackson State coach Tony Hughes, that's his claim to fame, recruiting. Um, fans that are upset. Um, with his record so far in the SWAC, say, oh, he's just a recruiter. He's not a coach. You know what I'm saying? But the man can recruit, and yes, the man can coach. Uh, Jackson State has added six new commits in its 2018 class. Um, And, you know, they even added a quarterback. So to run down the list of these young men, um, it's a crazy little acting crazy. They added two linebackers, a quarterback, uh, uh, a, a, a Callaway linebacker, my high school, Timothy Robinson, Greenwood linebacker, Carl Jones, Lawrence County athlete, Ken Darius Fizella. He is a tremendous athlete. Uh, he he actually has um, the, uh, FBS potential. Um, he was being recruited by several FBS uh, schools. So the Jack State got them a gym there. They also 
uh, received a commitment from Mobile, Alabama, receiver Michael Jefferson, Montgomery defensive back David Erickson IV, and Placenta, California quarterback Jack Strauss. So um, Coach Hughes is not playing games. He's really looking to turn it around at Jackson State. Um, he's hired a new offensive coordinator and Ham Mummy, which we reported on here last week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, trying to improve the talent level at Jackson State. And, you know, they're going to try and catch and surpass Alcorn this year. Uh, also, Gremlin had a surprise commit. Um, who would have thought that a young man who had a chance to play football uh, at the highest level would choose the swag champ over the national champ? What do you think about that, kid? What do you think? Did you, would you, what do you think? What do you think about that? A, uh, a football What's the guy's player. name? Um, his name is, let me scroll down here, um, Maurice Robinson. But I'm just saying, when you look when you look at, you know, college football, national champ, swag champ, you know, Alabama, Gramley. You know, uh, most people would probably think that's an easy choice to make. If Alabama wants you, that's where you go. Not for this young man, and he did have a committable offer from Alabama. Uh, he chose to go to Grambling. He's a three-star athlete and one of the top football prospects in the state of Alabama in the, top, in the class of 2018. He's a top 20 player. Um, he basically said that he didn't feed into the hype of what they were trying to sell. Kev, could this be a okay, start? Is, be this a- the, is this the guy that's coming out of – is this the guy that's coming out of Mobile? Maurice Robinson, yes. Okay, I thought he committed to another school. Oh, he committed to Grambling. Okay, maybe I'm thinking about another kid from Mobile that committed to another school. No, oh, he committed to Grambling. You know, okay. um, so- and okay. he he plays quarterback in high school. Uh, he's going to play defensive back at Grambling. Uh, but, you know, if Coach Fobbs – with Devontae leaving, if Coach Fobbs has quarterback struggle, I mean, this young man could help Grambling at quarterback because he's just that talented. He was probably going to play defensive back at Grambling. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, at Alabama. But he's choosing to play football at Grambling. That is a coup. You don't have okay, that so in this day and age. Did he change his position to play at Grambling, or was he changing positions before? No, he I'm just trying to make sure I get all of he, the, he the plays, before I come he, in. He plays quarterback in, um, in high school. But he Correct. actually, according to the story, you know, he threw for 60, over 600 yards and 18 touchdowns as a senior. But don't jump to conclusion that's where he's going to pick up where Devontae Kincaid left off. He wants to play defense. Uh, he says he's an athlete, and they asked me where I want to play. And he said, I want to play on the defensive side of the ball because he feels like that's where he can make it at the next level. That's a young man gotcha. who knows. And, I, you know, you you have guys – yeah, you have guys that, that switch positions. You had a guy from, from UJ that did the same thing. Like, once he's talking about, you know, declaring for the draft, he's going to switch positions too. So, I do. I think that's very great when you can get guys to commit. What, you, what you're looking at when you talk about uh, uh, grambling and getting these guys to commit that have thought about um, – you know, SEC schools, it's called aggressive, just aggressive uh, recruiting. They're doing a great job with recruiting. You're being aggressive in what you do. You're doing a great job in picking up, um, you know, possible SEC um, commits. You get guys that might want to commit to those other schools, and then they think about it and say, hey, you know, this might be a better choice for me as far as the HBCU. And then most of the time, you have these guys that can start right away or, you know, play whatever it is at HBCU as to where they're choosing your Alabamas, your LSUs, your, you know, your Albans or whatever school it might be, just throwing some out there. You know, you might have to sit on the bench three years before you even see the field. And then your breakout game comes in your senior year and no one saw you play prior to that or when somebody gets hurt or something like that. So right. I think it's always great when we can always get these gifts, uh, these guys to commit not only to our football programs, our basketball, our baseball, commit to our schools because exactly. – that just says to me that we're offering something in our HBCUs that is making them turn around and look. And when you can get aggressive and everybody can start recruiting and doing the same thing, you know, you find your, your point. You find your, your, your role. You find the way that you're supposed to come in, and I think it's a great thing. 
Exactly. And, you know, basically uh, his choice of his grammar was written direct. And I respected that from the start. That's what finalized my decision. The players and coaches made it feel like home. I was comfortable there. I liked the atmosphere. And that's what convinced me to make the decision to come there. So, you know, I, I think it's awesome. I can't wait to see what this young man does uh, when he gets to campus. Uh, is he going to be a nightmare in the swag? I mean, it's evident that he has talent to play football. You know, and, and, and I'm glad to see that him see him choose at HBCU. Uh, we just had a conversation uh, uh, with BJ uh, about, you know, how fans, you know, ridicule players who go to PWIs and then transfer down to HBCUs. You know, we, we had an interesting conversation with, with BJ. We Maybe we can get him on when when we get closer to signing day or after signing day when, when kids start committing and signing again. Uh, where we can talk recruiting and just talk the difference between uh, FBS, Power 5, FCS, PWI, FCS, HBCU, and just, you know, the type of athlete that wants to come to an HBCU. I mean, this young man, I applaud him. Uh, he's six foot one, 180 pounds. He has the frame to play defensive back uh, in the ACC. So he's going to be playing defensive back in the SWAC. And I think that is awesome. He feels like his ability to play quarterback is going to help him play defensive back and help him get to the next level. And he wants to do it in the swag. And I just think that's amazing. I think that's awesome because you don't have that often. And, 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 and that's one, that's something that we want to happen. We want the top tier athlete to feel like that they can get to the next level and, and come to Grambling. You know what I'm saying? If more prospects start coming to HBCUs, then that will that will start driving the exposure to our programs, and that is what right. we need. That's what and you've I been doing you know, all week long. Last week, that's what you have been doing. That's been your mission to get exposure for the SIAC ranked basketball teams. So, I think, and I think a lot of times the things I suffer with, I, I, I suffer with the fact you know it's every kid. Uh, Ultimately, it's every kid's decision. But what I suffer with is when we have us that literally just say, no, it can't, no, it won't happen. I, I suffer with that problem because, to me, if you, you've gone into I'm, – I'm one of those people. I don't know engineering, and I don't know IT, and I don't know this, and I don't know that. I stay in my lane. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you how to recruit. I'm not going to tell you how to fix a computer when I never recruited or fixed a computer or so on and so forth. And I think a lot of times, you know, you, like I said earlier, when the girl was saying how her dad recruited Walter Payton, she was saying how, oh, she, she was saying how he went in and had Bible study with the kid's grandma. Like, you have to meet the kids or meet these people, however, if it's, if it's by Snap, if whatever it is in this generation of social media. So if it's dance and move or whatever it is, you have to meet these people at their point of recruiting. However, you get it done, whoever you got to see, you got to know who you got on your team to recruit because right. we all know that you know you send who you send for recruiting and i know for certain they have a guy um quentin burrell quentin burrell over at gremlin is a is a, a really great friend of mine when it's time to recruit they send him to georgia one because quentin's from georgia quentin was a coach here in georgia so quentin knows the talent that's here in georgia so guess what when it's time to recruit and pick up kids from these backs woods and backsides of Georgia, guess who they send? They send Quentin because we know that Quentin knows what he's doing when it comes to recruiting talent in Georgia for Gremlin State University. You have to know who you have on your team when you're getting ready to recruit. And they offer a viable product. They tell how they do it, why they do it, and they just make it look so simple. But it's, it's a great thing. So, again, we have to buy into the product, buy into the philosophy, buy into it as well, and stop selling ourselves short thinking just because other people are doing it this way or thinking because they're doing it is right. We can have the same ability. Stop using, okay, we don't have the money. I get that. But you find other ways to recruit and pick up people, and we, we both can agree. Twitter is one of those ways. We heard Dominique Foy say last week how he, how he communicated with people on Twitter. People right. just have to know how to be effective when they recruit. They have to, be, have to know how to be effective when they're using social media, and you have to come across and get across to these children to let them know, why or how they should come to your school? I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. And I, I hope this trend continues because I, I'm waiting for the first 
uh, bona fide FBA prospect to commit to my alma mater. We definitely can offer playing time, and we can definitely say you can go pro uh, if you if you come to Valley. I mean, the greatest wide receiver of all time came out of Mississippi Valley. Um, we just need the athletes to want to come and get your books, play football, excel on the field uh, at any institution, HBC institution. And if you're good enough, when you get your opportunity, you'll be playing on Sundays. And, of course, you know, uh, with another professional football league starting in 2020, <laughs> that's going to be more opportunities for HBCU players to continue their, their football dreams uh, Vince McMahon is restarting the XFL, and he's saying it's going to be serious football. So that's just another avenue where HBCU players can potentially carve out uh, professional careers playing the game that they love. And I, I, I and I just uh, I'm I'm proud of our HBCU athletes at all sports: football, basketball, uh, softball, track and field, golf, bowling. I mean it. When you have, when you see a, a, a young athlete uh, competing at the HBCU level, you know they they're competing for the love of, of their sport. You know they're not competing for the glitz and the glamour; they're competing for the love of it. Kels? absolutely. I think a lot of times that that's the thing is, and that's one of the things that we must not get caught up in. It's like I tell people a lot of times. You know, we talk about the pay, and eventually the pay will come. But we do what we do for the passion of it. We do what we do because we really want to see these kids excel. We really want to see these kids get ahead. We really want to see these kids uh, get to the next level because they deserve the same exposure, the same respect, the same everything that other people are getting. So, you know, I, that's that's just what it is. But let's go ahead and take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. All right, we'll be right back with more Black, black College Experience in 25 seconds. Are you interested in attending an historically black college or university? Hello, my name is Robert Mason. I'm president and founder of the Common Black College application. Our application allows you to apply to any number of 44 historically black colleges and universities at the same time for only $35. So visit our website at www.commonblackcollegeapp.com to apply now. Thank you and get it. All right, we're back with more black college experience. Um, and um, uh, while we're waiting for our guests to call in, we can run down some more scores. Um, and the uh, well, first off, before we jump over to the um, you know, um, jump over to the MEAC and the men's basketball for this weekend, let's see here. Um, Coppin State defeated South Carolina State 73 to 65. Uh, Savannah State. Uh, blows out Delaware State by 20 points, uh, 106 to 86. Uh, Howard beats Maryland Eastern Shore, 85 to 75. North Carolina State beats North Carolina Central, 70 to 64. You know, we know that rivalry is definitely going to be heated. Uh, FAMU beats Hampton, 75 to 71. Uh, Norfolk defeats Bethune Cookman, uh, 71, 71 to 70. And uh, as we look at the, uh, the standings, in men's basketball, let's see here. All right, right now, uh, the big dog in the MEAC is North Carolina A&T. They stand at 6-1 and one in the conference, a shared record with Savannah State. But Thune Cookman is right behind them at 5-1. and one. NC Central at 5-2. and two. Morgan State at 4-3. and three. Got two teams at 3-3. Three and three. That's Norfolk State and FAMU. Uh, three teams at three and four. That's SC State, Howard, and Coppin State. Hampton at two and three. Maryland Eastern Shore at one and six. And Delaware State sits at zero oh and eight. Um, in the um, MEAC standings uh, on the women's side uh, for this weekend, uh, Bethune Cookman defeated Norfolk State fifty-eight to fifty-one. North Carolina A&T defeated North Carolina Central 67-54. Uh, Hampton defeated FAMU 66-65. Uh, Maryland Eastern Shore uh, defeated Howard 58-52. Uh, Coffee State blows out South Carolina State 56-39. And Delaware State blows out Savannah State 93-79. Uh, those are our weekend scores in the women's uh, for the MEAC and um, standings 
in the women's MIAC. Let's see here. Bethune Cookman, uh, women, uh, and North Carolina A&T uh, both sit undefeated, and they're going to be sitting at a collision course um, for the uh, MIAC championship, a uh, record hitting championship. So whenever those two teams meet, if they continue their winning ways, one of those two teams will take over, excuse me, first place in the MIAC women's basketball standings. Both schools have a a, a multiple game winning streak. Bethune Cookman at six games, uh, North Carolina and C is at seven games. Uh, four, two teams at four and one: Norfolk State and Hampton University. Uh, Coppin State at four and three. You have three teams at three and four: Morgan State, Howard, and North Carolina Central. And we have two teams at three and five: Middle Eastern Shore and Delaware State. FAMU at two and four. South Carolina State at two and five, and Savannah State at zero oh and seven. Um, and that's our women's standings for the MEAC. Um, we did have some tennis taking place in the SWAC um, over the over, for the past week. Uh, West Alabama uh, defeated Alcorn State six to one, uh, and that was on January twenty third. On Wednesday, January twenty fourth, Prairie View loses to Texas A and M Corpus Christi seven to zero. Um, Mercer defeats Alabama State 61. That was on Friday, January 26th. And while we're talking, you know, my daughter turned 11 uh, on last Thursday, you know, January 25th. And unfortunately, we had to push her birthday party back because she had the flu. But, you know, um, you know reading these, reading these um, scores, I just thought I would give my daughter a birthday shout-out. She only turns 11 once. Um, you only turn 11 once. What's that? I said, that's why you only turn 11 once. How is she feeling? Oh, she's she's feeling better. She'll be going back to school on tomorrow. You know, she had that had that dastardly flu, and that's been going around, and you know, um, kind of had her a little down, but she's doing fine. Um, you know, so some other some other um, scores. Okay. All right. So, um, some other updates, um, that I want to talk about. One story that I want to talk about, uh, before we went, went for the coach calls in, cause we are, we also talk about, you know, uh, HBCU graduates who, you know, make contribute con- contributions to the business world. And I found an article talking about CAU grad, Valicia Butterfield Jones. Um, she works for Google. And she has been making some major moves uh, with Google. Uh, she um, received a promotion. Uh, she is an executive, and she will continue to advocate for diversity and inclusion in tech, but on a new level with a new title. Uh, Google, the award-winning community engagement, multi- multicultural marketing, and communication strategy, confirmed to Black Enterprise that she has been promoted to global head of women and black community engagement for Google. In this role, she will be responsible for driving systematic and measurable change to create an even more inclusive culture at the tech giant. That just means, um, hopefully, she'll be uh, seeking to create um, a bridges to hire HBCU graduates, or at least uh, providing potential internships with HBCU graduates to see if they can fit the mold of what, Google, of what Google wants. And then, of course, when you do well at internships, that helps create job opportunities for HBCU graduates. So congratulations to Miss Butterfield Jones. I mean, she's a 39, she's 39 years old. She joined Google in 2016. So um, she hasn't been there but two years, Kills, and she's already making way. What do you think about that? I'm, I'm all for CAU. They're out here making a lot of noise out here. Um, it, I think it's it's a really good thing because, you know, they hold a lot of prestige around the CAU between CAU, uh, once was Morris Brown, of course, Spelman, and, and Morehouse. So, you know, with those co- four colleges in, in, in the area, um, I think that's a lot. Of, a lot. And, and Google is a major, major, major place, major corporation. So I think that's a really great thing when you start looking at places like uh, Google, 
uh, major corporations like that, and especially with it being an HBCU alumna and also being an African-American woman. So, you know, I'm uh, very excited when I hear that type of thing and uh, see that type of thing going on. So props to her. Congratulations to her for uh, for doing that, getting that thing done. Um, I did want to talk about, um, still while we're waiting, um, Battle of the Bands. It looks like it's in right now that they're not sure if Battle of the Bands is going to be held here next year in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, wow. Battle of the Bands did take uh, did take place on yesterday. Um, my sister, my nephew, brother-in-law, they did attend. Of course, my sister is a graduate of, of Alabama A&M. My nephew is currently enrolled at Tennessee State. Um, so, you know, this is like a HBCU house divided when it comes to our family. <laughs> um, but right Just now, like mine. You, it is. It's, it's just divided. And what what you're looking at is, you know, a lot of people turn out for Battle of the Bands. And I saw a guy make this statement from Alcorn. Terry says, it, wouldn't it be nice if we could get the same amount of people to go to the Celebration Bowl, to these bowl games, as we get for Hunter Battle of the Bands? And I could be no more in agreement than that. And over the course of time, we watched our bands grow. We watched our dance lines grow. We watched all of the competition. And these have become like the front runners and the front lines and the front recruitment of our schools. And we see people are going to school for, you know, on these scholarships and they get into the schools and they, these are the mainstreams and they're the main point of our schools. When you, when you look at the bands, you can look at the sonic boom, you can look at the human jukebox. You start looking at all of these bands, you look at the aristocrats with, with Tennessee State and the, you know, you got the, with, with uh, Alabama State, you got the, you start looking at, then you have the honeybees and you start looking at all these things, dancing dolls. These have become the recruiting tools for the school. So, exactly. When you talk about all of the attendance and all the people that turn out to this, why can't we get the same attendance when it comes to our sports programs from week to week? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say the band competitions are cheaper, and of course you know when you have family environments, um, you know you get more bang for your buck. Uh, go on to a battle of the bands than you will go on to a football game. Um, you know, we, and we have this argument every year. Do fans go to the football game to see the football teams or see the halftime show? That's a split um, answer. You have some fans that do like football, but they go specifically to see what the band's going to do, how the dancing dolls are going to look. Or they may have they may have a child in the band and they're going to support their child. Um but like I say, if you when you look at the price for the event, uh most football games are gonna run you maybe about maybe what, twenty, twenty five dollars for a ticket? Uh band band competitions were gonna be what by ten to fifteen dollars for a ticket. So uh, economics, I mean, um yeah, I don't know what band competition band competition you going to because clearly those <laughs> tickets here were way more than ten bucks. Well, I, I don't know what you going to watch. I guess, it's not I guess be the ones $10. that I've seen advertised be like they be like ten dollars, yeah. you know, for for a battle of the bands. Yeah. I've never been to Honda, right. so, you, so I don't know yeah. how much Honda costs. But I know the local and then you competitions look at, they have here, the tickets are like ten bucks. Right. I mean, I'm but you, but even local. at that, the logistics of this, even with the ticket prices being more, because they were more. You still have more people coming here because the ticket prices of Honda, and then you look at the attendance, and then you look at the ticket prices for Celebration Bowl, and you look at the attendance. You had more people at Honda than you had at Celebration Bowl. And I give you this because my sister did three tickets, her and my brother-in-law, and it's $101 for three tickets. You got the ticket prices, and, of course, you got the fees. But that's $101 on three tickets. So again, when you look at the logistics to that, but my whole thing once again is how do you get us actual bowl games buy into our program instead of and I'm not knocking the band because the band is just as important, but can we get them to buy into the the sports programs the same way they buy into the band is simply my point. I I, I agree. I mean the the band is its own animal. I mean. I guess when the band is playing, you can get up and dance. Okay. 
You can get up and dance, shake your booty, you know, uh, you know, sing the song. Football, you're watching the sport. Uh, you know, yeah, you're going to jump up and cheer, but you're not going to get up and sing along with the football team. You're not going to get up and do, you know, do the dance or, or the chant uh, with the football team. With the band, you're going to sing along while the band is playing. You're going to chant while the band is playing. You know what I'm saying? It, it, the band gets the crowd more involved because of the nature of what the band does. And, and that, that, that's the difference of the two entities of a football game. Football game is on the field. Band is in the stands with the stand, with the fans, you know? But right. I, I, I do want to see, you know, there has to be a, 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 a way to, you know, balance out the two because both are needed to have a quality black college experience at a football game. Imagine going to a football game and there is no band. There is no halftime show. There is no dancing girls. There is no drum major. There is no announcer, um, you know, talking about the exploits of this of the band and just getting crunk on the mic. I mean, imagine not having it at an HBCU football game. You know, you have to find some other form of entertainment. You know, we don't want rappers at HBCU football games. We want the bands. That's what we want. That's what we I want. I mean, and it's even just, like, you know, even when I was looking at, you know, looking at the whole last week watching Morehouse and even watching Morehouse last week or, excuse, yeah, watching Morehouse last Saturday, you know, they had like the pep band. So you even have, even if we're not going to have full band, you even have a pep band and you still have the dancers and then you have the basketball dancers, which will be equivalent to Southerns, like I say, blue and gold, you still have that. So with the, with the HBCU, you get the whole experience. You get the dance team, the band, and you get the, the athletes. You get the whole experience. And, you know, you get the halftime. You get all of these things that's going to happen and keep you entertained while watching a good game and watching or, or listening to the band and, and, and seeing the dancers. Now, I, I do, because I have to say this. This was just then, I'm going to say about 10 minutes ago, I got this. Right now, the only team in the country that is undefeated, hear me again, in the country, is Morehouse. In the country, the only undefeated basketball team on all levels is Morehouse. Um, they haven't lost a game. You're talking about, you're talking about men? Morehouse don't have a women's team. It's a man's school. Oh, okay. Well, okay. <laughs> well, you got hey, you, you said basketball all levels. I mean, I mean, because my, my 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 lady Bulldogs is undefeated in the SEC. But you know, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, brain brain yeah. freeze. Brain freeze. Yeah. So, so, yeah. But so, that, I mean, that's 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 major. An HBC, that is major. The only. The only no undefeated. Duke. I'm sorry, I should have said men's. Yeah, men's basketball. No, no dude. That's major. No Virginia. No North Carolina Tar Heels. Morehouse. But here we have Morehouse, and it's it's getting crazy and crazier because as they get ready to travel and go on, you know, it's going to be more and more. I actually got a chance to check out Clark Atlanta on Monday, and I checked out both the women and the men's teams, and they played Claflin, and it was an intense environment. And, and you had the thing that I love about our HBCUs is that we show up. They're showing up and they're supporting these kids now. And, you know, you, you had this this past week where uh, Coach Brewer, they, they did, they had an interview on TV on uh, on uh, five, uh, 11 Alive. can never get this. They had an interview and then over at Clark you had Fox 5 and then you have all these different things. And they, I think they were, on, they were on Dukes and Bell on Friday, which is 92.9 here the major sports station here. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff that's, that's swirling around them right now. Um, but one of the things was, that, and you know, I was just kind of, when I was looking at the interview, um, and I was listening to the coach talking about the philosophy and we always ask, is there something that you tell? And he was saying the one thing that he tells them that they have bought into is not today. And simply not today means that when they're competing with someone and someone comes in, that means not today, whoever we're competing with, not today simply means you're not going to win today. Basically shoot they beat them on their court they beat them away wherever they are they're just saying not today you're not gonna win today so it's like all the team has bought into the philosophy and that's that's a simple thing when you look at what coach brewer is doing with his team being like the third coach in morehouse history to actually like have the most wins so 
I think they're doing a great thing. And it says, you know, looking at it, saying that he, you know, they have continued to be a top team every year in the division that, that you know, that they're in, in in basketball. And he continues to keep them up in that standard. So to be undefeated at this point, the only one in the country, says a lot. And, of course, we're going to continue to drive it. If we're going to continue to drive it, of course, I'm going to continue to drive it because, one, I'm right here in Atlanta, so <laughs> there's no excuse for it. And, two, they deserve, once again, these kids deserve the same type of exposure, the same type of notoriety, the same attention, TV or whatever it is that other people will get, your Dukes, your Tar Heels, your exactly. every other school, your, 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 your Mississippis that you just said. They deserve your UConn. You're saying the same attention. I, I, I agree it's, it's, with you. And, it's basketball. You know, with us and with you, with us having uh, the undefeated, which you know is associated with ESPN. I mean, I, I think they need to do a better job at providing exposure to our HBCU athletic programs. I mean, if, if ESPN is going to you know task the undefeated with you know, with that, um, then they need to take the ball and run with it. You know what I'm saying? You know, find a way to. <laughs> Or uh, have a have weekly features on HBCU sports. Um, exactly, exactly. You know. I mean, I've even gotten to the point like yesterday. I was like, "All right, let's Ooh. go ahead and talk about the hum." Uh oh, have a caller. We do have a caller on the line, and it is yeah, a this- caller out of Atlanta, Georgia. Who do we have? Yeah, this is Coach Brewer from Morehouse College in Atlanta. All right, our Morehouse. guest of honor. How you doing, Coach Brewer? I'm doing fine. Well, uh, I'm going to let Keisha uh, uh, take the lead with this interview. Um, you know, Keisha, go ahead and introduce everybody to our um, guest for tonight. Well, we I just, been, you know, I was over there trying to, I was trying to talk about the coach. It looked like he did, He felt the spirit and, and, and kind of heard it going there. Coach, we're not going to prolong the introduction because we already know what you do. We already know what you're capable of. And we already know that you're 18 to know. So, Coach, <laughs> I guess I'm going to just start it right here. Now, looking at you being undefeated at this point, and this is what I was just telling them when you had the, the saying, not today, and you got the team to actually buy into that philosophy of not today. What does that mean to you and your team? Well, um, one day they came into practice and everybody was kind of uh, lollygagging around and the energy wasn't there. And I just – told everybody, I called them in the circle, and I said, not today. And they looked at me, and I told them, I said, back when I was growing up, when I came into the house, or I was doing something that my parents didn't think was bringing something positive, they would say, that spirit that's on you, not today. And so they just picked it up. I said, when anyone comes into our arena to play us or we're going to play games, Last thing I said in the locker room, not today. And so they bought into it, and it's it's, it's kind of carried, got its own uh, character now, not today. <laughs> okay, now being – I know, and I know being the undefeated – being in an undefeated environment, being now, I say once again, being 18 and old, and I, I saw the – saw the interviews and I, I saw the one on TV. I didn't catch Friday's interview, but I have like just, you know, just seeing the whole thing and watching it unfold and seeing the different things um, with the, the children, you know, going up into now, what has your, well, what was your recruiting process like, I guess, prior to this? Well, that, that was a vision uh, from 2012. Uh, we, we went up to Kentucky. We played Kentucky, the university of Kentucky in an exhibition mm-hmm. game. And everybody thought I was crazy for doing it. Uh, that was the team that won a national championship with Anthony Davis, Gil Chris. They had about six uh, first-round draft picks on that team. And everybody was saying I was crazy for doing it. But I wanted to show our kids the top of NCAA college basketball. That's the top-of-the-shelf type basketball. And I wanted them to experience that. And – uh from that point on, I told them that uh, that uh, this is what it's all about. If you plan on winning championships, you got to be at your best when your best is needed. And so that process, we started to try to get money to recruit players because I was only having four scholarships at the time, and they beat us 
like we stole a government mule. It beat us to, uh, I can't remember, by 80 points. But the lesson from that was that you got to compete and that you know that you're not better than what you think you are and you got to get in the gym and work. And so from that process, uh, Dr. John Wilson was the president at the time, and he invested in us scholarships. And uh, so this is his baby now that we are, we are raising. Uh, he put money into the basketball uh, program and, uh, you know, gave me now I have eight to nine scholarships. And this is the product of that. You, you get scholarships, you can get good players. And, you know, it's like you're not shopping just with $100 now. You got, you're shopping with money where you can go and get players and bring them in and put them on scholarships. So this is a product of the president vision, a uh, formal president vision. And I hope that Dr. Um, new president will, 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 uh, Dr. Thomas will continue to invest in us because I think it can work for us. Okay. Now in the 2011, 2000, let's say 12, that was your 12, this is like 12 season, uh, I guess, coaching for Morehouse and you were an assistant under the legendary coach, Arthur McAfee, correct? Yes. Okay. What was that like? Oh, great experience, Coach McAfee. We had the privilege this year to dedicate the floor to him, his the court, uh, the Arthur J. McAfee Jr. court. Uh, I mean, he's a legend. He's a legend in himself. He's a great coach, a great person. And uh, that experience under him, he allowed me to uh, do a whole lot of things that assistant coaches were not doing at the time. And that's you know, uh, handle defense, uh, go out and recruit. He get, he let me do basically everything that a head coach would do, and he prepared me for this job. And he, uh, I mean, he just, I can't say enough about him and, and what he has been and what he mean, means to me, my mentor, my friend, and, and uh, just a great person. Okay, Coach. 40-20 win se- or four twenty win seasons, four SIC regular season championships, a SIAC championship, a SIAC tournament championship, and two NCAA tourna- tournament appearances. And you still manage within the last 10 years to continue to make sure that the Morehouse uh, stay remains in the top of Division II basketball programs in the country. How do you manage to do it? Well, it's, it's patience and, and uh, investing in kids and believing in kids and giving them that opportunity to come up and and show what they can do. I mean, we're not going to all we're not going to get the blue chip player, we're not going to get the red chip player. We're probably not going to get the white chip player. But we we're going to get good kids who are educationally sound, who have a vision of of uh playing and producing in basketball and getting better. And we give them that opportunity and and they come in, they work hard. We we graduate our kids a lot of our kids are lawyers and doctors and coaches and teachers and I mean so forth and so on. And so I'm very proud of that. You know, I'm an I'm an alum of Morehouse. I graduated in class of eighty. And so I take a lot of pride in what Morehouse believes in, what we're all about. And so uh just you know, staying humble and staying hungry myself and I try to uh and inject that into them when they come to the school. Just be humble and be hungry about your vision and what you want to do. Okay, Coach, and um, this is Derek Thomas. Um, This is your 18th year at Morehouse, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, do you, how long do you think you want to continue coaching? <laughs> That's a good question, man. I have a great – uh, assistant coach by the name of Douglas Whitler, and I'm tr- training him, uh, teaching him the same way Coach Arthur McAfee taught me uh, to become a head coach and what to do at this level in the situations that presented to him. And he's going to be a great coach. It might not be at Morehouse, who knows, but he's next in line. He's going to be a great college basketball coach. He's a hard worker. Uh, he, he understands, uh, division two basketball. He's a Morehouse man. He's played overseas basketball. So he understands the whole, uh, thing about what basketball at the collegiate level is about and where kids are trying to go. 
He's a younger fella. And so I, I think, you know, uh, I have a son who's coming out this year of high school, uh, Xavier Brewer, and he might end up playing. So I'd like to see him a couple of years there, and, and we'll see what happens. But I enjoy doing it. You know, when, you're, when your play is your work and your work is your play, right. uh, there's no end to it. And I mean, is- coach, really, really, there have been three coaches in the history of Morehouse. Uh, one, Dr. Forbes, who the building is named after, he coached there for 35 years. Uh, next, Coach McAfee, Arthur J. McAfee, he coached there for 36 years. And myself, I've only been there 18, so I'm the junior there. So. <laughs> but I don't plan on being there as long as those guys were, uh, you know. And, and and that just shows, you know, Morehouse, when a coach comes to Morehouse, they don't come just to build their resume up and they leave. They make their home there. And, you know, with you being a Morehouse man and your assistant coach being a Morehouse man, you know, he may want to stay and wait till you retire to take the reins over and continue the tradition that you have built. Yeah, I mean, it it will be a great opportunity for him uh, if he does that. But uh, I would never hold him back from having an opportunity to go elsewhere. Like I said, he's an outstanding young coach, and he's going to – if not Morehouse, he's going to make a great coach for someone in this country. Right now, um, right now, you, yesterday you defeated Payne College, eighty-three to seventy-three, and um, you're still undefeated, as Kale said earlier. Um, in the standings, it's you and CAU uh, in the conference. Uh, so you're, you're sitting at thirteen and zero, and Clark Atlanta is sitting at twelve and zero. Do you have a game between Clark Atlanta Circle? On your calendar, or the, you know, with that being no, we 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 really don't. I mean, all the fans and everybody is excited about that game that's coming up, and it's going to be a, a fantastic game because the bottom line is the last time we played, uh, we haven't lost a game. Uh, they beat us in the tournament last year in the semifinals in a three point game or a five point game. I can't really remember, and uh, I just told my guys. Remember this feeling of how you feel losing to your cross street little brother, and you don't want to feel this way ever again. And yes, so, indeed. from that point on, I think those guys understand the uh, intensity and the emergency of getting better over the summer and, and getting better preseason. And so, this is where all this is manifested from. Uh, just not really want to lose ever again because of that feeling they got losing to their cross uh, street brother across the street. Right. And, you know, what do you think about playing uh, out of conference, other out of conference and then competing against other HBCUs at the division two level and also uh, at, you know, the division one level? Well, we've done that this year. We 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 played uh, UAB in an exhibition game. We we played uh, uh, Winston Salem State and CIAA. We beat them. We we beat Shaw University at CIAA. Mm-hmm. We beat West Georgia that's out of the Gulf South. We beat um, Rollins that's in the Sunshine Conference. They were number eleven at the time when we beat them, and we beat uh, Florida Tech. So we went the whole gamut of our region and right. played out of our region, and and we played uh, CIAA historical black colleges, and and we played the Division One. So we've done it all, and uh, you know our guys have no fear. I mean, last year we played the University of Georgia, and we played uh, also we 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 played Ole Miss, and so the, our guys have been on the stage. So it's how nothing does, that they fear. How does uh, play when it comes to competition. Did did, did, how did y'all play against Ole Miss? Because I'm not a Rebels fan. We, the score. The score was score was 36 to 32 at halftime, and my star player Tyrius Walker tweaked his knee, oh. and they ended up beating us by about 16 points. I would have and, loved uh, to have had y'all defeat them Rebels. <laughs> well, we we were there with them the same mm-hmm. with Georgia. Um, it, it was a, a four point two point game at halftime, and you know when they when you have more scholarships, Division One gets 13 scholarships, Division Two gets 10. And so you just have a few more horses that that you can throw out there to tie you out, and, and that ends up what's, what what happened with us. Uh, same thing with UAB this year. We were we were it was a two 
point, four point ball game with four minutes to go. And uh, we had an opportunity to, to win the game, but it didn't happen. But that, that's an exhibition game. But it puts our guys on the stage to be able to compete against Division One and high level play. And so when we come in our conference, there's no fear of going anywhere and playing anybody. Right. And, 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 and it's good that you have instilled that mentality because when you're going up against a proposed bigger bigger team with better athletes, you can't go into the game with fear. You got to feel like you can take that guy off the dribble, like you can net a three-pointer in his eyes, just like you're playing somebody in your conference. So, you know, right. when, you, when you take that basketball court, I mean, it's man on man, five on five on that basketball court. I mean, Kel says this a lot. You know, it's harder for us to compete in football because that's more of a physical sport. And a lot of the players uh, at, at, at HBCU and Division II level football may not be as big as they are at the FBS level. But in basketball, oh, the, the, the size, yeah. there, there are some – you can you can, you can can find a seven-footer to play for you just like Kentucky can find a seven-footer to play for you. When you man up, man on man, it's about beating your man right then and there off the dribble or faking him out or just, you know, posting him up. I mean, yeah, I understand the talent level. You know what I'm saying? You, you, these these guys that are, you know, five-star, four-star prospects, yeah, but they can still be beaten. I mean, they're not perfect basketball players. They're not going to go 10 for 10. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you get a hand no, in the face. It, it, it. It, it's all about competing, you know, right. regardless of how talented someone is. This is what I preach to my players. Regardless of how talented someone is or someone's supposed to be, if you play hard every possession, usually 90% of the people are going to eventually give up if you come at them hard. And so that's what we kind of preach. Just play hard. Just keep playing hard. Make mistakes. You go make mistakes. Just play hard through them. So... Um, I mean, Division One basketball players, they, they, uh, they're they bigger. You know, you get an Anthony Davis like what we went up against back then I'm, in, in the Gilcrest. I mean, come on, those top, those some of the top in the, yeah. in the nation. But, uh, I mean, it, it let our guys see. Uh, and then next year we end up competing or winning a regular season championship. And then we end up getting to the championship game. They beat us by three championship games. So, that experience helped, you know, perpetuate uh, us into being a better team. Right. And, and, and I, I definitely agree with you there because when you play against tough competition like that and you don't have any fear, especially if you're going to attack them, I mean, that just shows you don't have any fear attacking players at your right. uh, division level. So, I mean, I think that was a good trip for you. I, I think that will continue to work for you in the future. The game plan that you have, you know, to expose your players um, to that to that environment, because it, it, you know you either gonna you either gonna uh, uh, adapt or you're not gonna adapt. Sink or swim. So you know whether you Absolutely. lose the game, but if you play, if you don't play intimidated, if you just play your best, I mean, in the, in, in sports, there's gonna be a winner or a loser. But if you play right. and you don't quit. I mean, that's all you can do is if you leave it out there on the court. And I, and I think that's what you're teaching your players, no matter who the opponent is, uh, you leave it all on the court. You don't play scared. You don't get let you don't let them intimidate because they're a five-star and you are a two-star. Who cares? You know, you put right. your shorts on and your sneakers on just like they put their sneakers on. You can block their shot just like they can block yours. Right, right. So, Kels? You you did. You mentioned one of your star players, and I guess that's what I was going to ask you about, to kind of talk a little bit about your senior players on the team. Well, we have three seniors, uh, co-captains, uh, Martravius Little. Uh, he's a 6'1 guard out of Wickelson County, Georgia. I mean, he's a, he's a spiritual leader as well as our leader on the court. Um, Tyrius Walker, he's a 6'1 point guard out of Atlanta, Georgia, Grady High School. He's our leading scorer, leader assist. Uh, I mean, he's just a super athlete that can, that competes every night. I mean, recently he had 47 points against Benedict in a uh, heated contest for the top spot of the SIAC. 
and we have uh, Jordan Wallace, who's a 6'4 uh, shooting guard out of uh, Flint, Michigan. Uh, he's He's been with us for two years. He's a junior college transfer from Oakland. Uh, Oakland City, I think, in, in Detroit Junior College. But um, those three guys are phenomenal. They, they, they've come through a big time this year, gained the leadership in the locker room from them. Uh, has been uh, fantastic. And uh, we just look for them to continue to lead us down the way. And so, Coach, who is your next opponent, and how are y'all preparing for this next game? Because I know it's one game at a time. Right. Our next opponent is Claflin University out of uh, Orangeboro, South Carolina. Uh, they were, uh, last week coming into our arena, they had a 16-game win streak, and we defeated them last week at our place. So this week we have to go up there and play them on Wednesday at, at 8 o'clock. Uh, in, yeah. And so I look forward to be a uh, knockdown, drag-out fight because uh, – you know, they, they've dropped a couple of games since we played them, but they're going to be ready for us. Right now, everybody's going to have a target on their on our back. Of course. To, to of course. At, actually, I, uh, at, at this time, we're the only undefeated team in the country in, uh, in Division One, Two, and Three basketball, NCAA, because West Liberty just lost today uh, to Fairmont State, uh, 98 to 97. But you all got that hot off the press now. <laughs> You know what? That's why I say you felt my spirit because right before you came on, let's see, uh, Chapman had t- he had sent me that same information. I said this is the only defeated team in the country right now. Morehouse, the, 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 only, the, only, the only undefeated team in the country. That's it. The <laughs> only one. So yeah. I was like, people need to know about what's going on. And I was there last week when y'all played Claflin. And they stuck with y'all for a little while, and, and by the end of the game, it was just it, – it was just – it was over. I was like, okay, well, I guess they're not going to stick with them. And then I went and watched Claflin play Clark, and they mm-hmm. both lost there. So I was like, okay, well, Claflin, you know, they're, they're, they're dropping, and I've, I've had some conversations back and forth. But to see this many teams, it HBCU teams that's doing this thing, especially – I'm going to say this once again, especially sitting here in Atlanta, you have – Clark and Morehouse that's that's playing some great basketball. I was like, they need all, I say all the the camera time that they can send. Send every cameraman you can, send whoever you can, because they deserve that attention. And I'm I'm pretty sure going in playing class on this going to be a hostile territory. But y'all do, y'all have a a group of people, I guess it's called, what is it, the the Turk Tigers? That's that's, that's one group. That's a group. Yeah, got the Turk Tigers. They are lit. That group keeps the momentum going, and it's really good to see that happening in in, in that gym. See, you know, them out there packing it. But it, it really was a great game last week. But I do, I really do. I know going in, of course, it's going to be what it's going to be. But I, I wish y'all luck, and I hope y'all come on back with that win. Well, we look forward to the competition, and we just take it one game at a time. You know, I always tell them poise in the noise. The noise doesn't matter. We just got to keep our poise and execute execution kills and uh, just do your job. Do your job and it'll take care of itself. Take care of itself. That's it. Derek, you have anything else? I don't know. That's all I have. I I, I would love to see you finish this season undefeated. We're definitely going to be watching. And, Coach, I mean, you're, you're family now. You've been a guest. So you don't have to uh, have a scheduled interview. Anytime you want to call in and talk about uh, basketball or any sport in regards to HBCUs, uh, Sunday night says six, feel free to call in um, and just let us know what's on your mind. I, I definitely would do that. I, I got you in my phone now, and I definitely would do it. I appreciate you guys uh, putting me on the air and let me discuss about Morehouse basketball. Yes, sir. And we thank you much, Coach, and I'll, see, I'll I'll be out there somewhere. I'll catch you somewhere. All right. Well, go Maroon Tigers, and I appreciate it. Hey, good night, Coach. Bye. Oh, Kels, I love his philosophy. Absolutely. 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 I've listened to the, the Stay Hungry and Stay Humble. I heard him say that the other day, but he does. They have bought into it. And to hear him talk about how they went up and played Kentucky, that that was an interesting story because he wanted them to 
see what top talent was. And I think that was great that he exposed them to it. Right. To let them see what it was like. Exactly. I mean, you you have to expose your players uh, to a hostile environment because when you're exposed Mm -hmm. to a hostile environment, like I said, you're either going to sink or swim. You're either going to adapt or you're going to let it, you know, eat you up. And it looks like his That's team true. adapted, and they went on to you know, right. have a successful season. And it set the groundwork for this undefeated season here. Um, you know, uh, and I hope they continue their winning ways because I, I think it would be historic to have them uh, run the table. I think it would be awesome. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So, next week is Super Bowl week. Right. How exciting. So I, we won't do a show next week for Super Bowl week. But we will be back the following week. That's right. We'll be back. So, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, you know, make sure you enjoy the Super Bowl. And while we're while we're um, talking about that, we're not going to have a show on, on Super Bowl Sunday. Who are you picking, the Patriots or the Eagles? Um, I, You know, I always say I don't, I don't ever have a prediction. But, you know, you have to look at the, the things you have. Tom Brady, um, you know, looking back at last week's game, they are a team that they, they can compete. They, every time, they, they, the thing that I always say about them is I live by the same thing. They don't flinch. They just don't flinch. They don't, they don't get in a situation where they're, they're worried, they're not bothered, they're not frustrated. They just win the game. And the second half, and so, you know, shots out to number 98, Trey Flowers, straight out of Huntsville uh-huh. for the new <laughs> Patriots. I'm going to go ahead and say the Patriots. Debo says that his new uh, – that his Philadelphia Eagles will beat them by 10, but I'm I'm still going to go with the Patriots, Bill well, Belichick and Tom Brady. Uh, I'm going to roll with the Eagles because I don't want – the Patriots to win the Super Bowl. I'm tired of them winning. But here is what the Eagles will have to do to win. Make sure you're up by enough points that Tom Brady doesn't get the ball back with two minutes left and comes back and beats you. That's how he did Jacksonville. That's what he did to the Falcons last year. I mean, the man is clutch. You have to give him that. So, mm-hmm. you know, if the Eagles want to win this game, I mean, how many times have you? How many times have you saw somebody make two point conversions back to back to back to back to back to back like he did? Like, come on, that doesn't happen. But you know, but we yeah, will but see. I, I'm will I'm see. hoping the Eagles can get their revenge because, as you know, uh, yeah, the last time the Patriots and the Eagles played in the Super Bowl it was Brady versus McNabb and To, and uh, the Patriots right. were able to escape with that win. So, you know, I, I'm hoping that the Eagles pull it out. You know, I'm hoping that they pull it out. So, um, I don't have anything. So, you know, we'll be off next week, as Kel said. But make sure you tune in. Let's see. The next time we will be on will be... Come on, calendar. That will be February 11th. So, we'll be back February 11th. That will be three days before Valentine's Day, the day of love. So, make sure you tune Woo-hoo! in to us uh, on February 11th at 7 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. For Derek Thomas and Keisha Kelly, this is Black College Experience. We are out of here. Good night.